Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. We've been talking about reversible reactions in equilibrium ever since video 15, and today we'll wrap up that discussion by using equilibrium to think about insoluble compounds. When we do, we'll find out that there's actually a big approximation we've been making ever since the early parts of General Chemistry 1. To find out what it is, let's start by thinking about the solubility of ionic compounds. Way back in the early days of General Chem 1, we learned that many ionic compounds are soluble in water, such as sodium chloride, but certain ionic compounds are insoluble and form precipitates. At the time, we saw that there are a small number of rules we can use to predict whether an ionic compound is soluble or not. Here are those rules. To refresh your memory, Rule 1 tells us that any compound that has a cation from the first column of the periodic table is soluble in water. So that's every ionic compound that has any of these elements in it, including sodium and potassium. That takes care of a lot of compounds. Also, all compounds with ammonium ion as the cation are soluble. Next, all compounds that have an anion of nitrate or acetate are soluble, no matter what the cation is. That takes care of another huge number of compounds. So far, these rules are pretty easy to remember, but unfortunately the rest of the solubility rules have exceptions. The third rule is that compounds that have an anion of chloride, bromide, or iodide are soluble except when the cation is in this little area of the periodic table, silver, mercury, thallium, and lead. You'll learn why these are exceptions if you take an advanced inorganic chemistry course. It's related to the radii of the ions, but for now, I'm afraid you'll just need to remember them. So, a compound containing chloride, bromide, or iodide, and one of these four elements will form a precipitate. The next rule says that all compounds that have an anion of sulfate are soluble, except when the cation is one of those same four elements, or the ones at the bottom of column two of the periodic table calcium, strontium, barium, or radium. There are two more solubility rules to know. So far, all of them have described compounds that are all soluble, except for a few exceptions that we mentioned. The last two rules describe cases where the compounds are almost all insoluble, so these are compounds that are usually precipitates. First, compounds that have an anion of carbonate, phosphate, or sulfide are all insoluble, except for the ones that have a cation described by rule 1. So, these are all insoluble unless the cation is from column 1 of the periodic table, or ammonium. And the last solubility rule tells us that compounds that have an anion of hydroxide are all insoluble, except for the ones that have a cation described by rule 1 again, or ones from the bottom of column 2 of the periodic table. So, calcium, strontium, barium, or radium. These six solubility rules cover tens of thousands of different compounds and all the compounds that we'll work with in this course. But, it turns out that these solubility rules are all a big lie. Well, not really a lie, but an exaggeration. It turns out that most of the insoluble compounds really do dissolve a little bit. So, for example, solubility rule 3 tells us that silver chloride should be an insoluble compound, but actually a very small amount of silver chloride does dissolve in water. When it does, we get this reaction. Notice that this is a reversible reaction. That's true for the dissociation reactions of all compounds that we usually think about as being insoluble. There are a couple of interesting things to notice about this reaction. First of all, notice the phases of the reactants and products. The reactant is a solid, and the products are aqueous ions. That makes this reaction the opposite of a precipitation reaction. That makes sense, because in this case we're interested in knowing how much of this compound actually dissolves, so we want the dissolved ions to be on the product side. This reaction also has an interesting equilibrium expression. As you know, the equilibrium expression is usually written as products over reactants, and for this reaction, that gives us this. But wait, remember, we usually don't include solids in the equilibrium expression, so we'll leave out the solid silver chloride. That means our equilibrium expression is just the product of the two ions in the solution. That'll be true for all reactions like this one, where we have a solid compound that dissolves to give aqueous ions. 
Reactions like this are fairly common in chemistry, and as we'll see, the equilibrium constant is very useful for determining the amount of solid that can dissolve. Because they're used in chemical studies so often, the equilibrium constant of a reaction like this gets its own name, the solubility product constant, and its own symbol, Ksp. Just like the Ka for acids and the Kb for bases, there's a list of Ksps for different insoluble salts in Appendix D. Let's see what we can do with the Ksp. Suppose you add solid silver chloride to water. What mass of silver chloride would dissolve in one liter of water? To solve this problem, just remember that this is a reversible reaction, so we'll solve it just like we've solved other questions related to reversible reactions. We'll draw a rice table. First, we'll write down the chemical reaction. As we saw just a moment ago, the equilibrium expression doesn't include the solid compound, so we won't need to know the amount of solid in the reaction. That means we can leave that column of the rice table blank. The initial concentration of the products is zero. In the next row, we'll write the change in the concentration. We don't know how much that is yet, so we'll write x. Since it's a one-to-one -one ratio, we have x for both of the products. That means the equilibrium concentrations will also be x. And now we can plug the final concentrations into the equilibrium expression. If we look up the value of Ksp in Appendix D, we find out that it's 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10. Now we can solve the equation for x, which gives us 1.34 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. But we're not quite done yet. The question asks us for the mass of silver chloride, not the molarity. Remember, molarity is the moles of solute divided by the liters of solution. Since we have 1 liter of solution, that means we have 1.34 times 10 to the minus 5 moles. If we use the periodic table, we find that a mole of silver chloride weighs 143.21 grams, which means that the mass of dissolved silver chloride is 0 0.00192 grams. Let's think about that answer for a minute. The mass of dissolved silver chloride is very tiny, less than 2 milligrams in an entire liter of water. That's the reason that we usually say that silver chloride is insoluble. A tiny amount actually does dissolve, but it's such a minute amount that it's easy to overlook. The same will be true of all salts that we usually identify as insoluble. Also, notice that the value of Ksp was extremely small. You might recall that when an equilibrium constant is much smaller than 1, that means the reaction favors the reactants instead of the products, and that's certainly the case here. The reactant is the solid compound, and there's much more of that than there is of the dissolved ions. Let's try another harder example. Suppose we have a liter of water, and we add the salt lead 2 iodide to it. What mass of the lead iodide will dissolve? Lead iodide is an especially interesting example because the salt itself is a beautiful yellow color. It used to be used as a paint pigment called iodine yellow, but it's never used in paints nowadays because now we know that lead is toxic. Anyway, we'll answer the question by starting with a rice table. The chemical reaction is this. Solid lead iodide dissolves to form a lead ion and two iodide ions. Just as in the last reaction, we can leave out the amount of solid compound. The initial concentration of the products is zero. But this time, we need to be careful when we figure out the change in the concentrations. This is the first reaction we've looked at in quite a while that doesn't have a one-to-one -one ratio between all the compounds. Instead, there's a one-to-two -two ratio in the products. So the change in concentration is x for the lead and 2x for the iodide. And that's also what the equilibrium concentrations will be. Now we can solve for x. We'll start out by writing the equilibrium expression. Here again, we need to be a little careful. Remember, the equilibrium expression should have the concentrations of the products each raised to an exponent that is the coefficient from the chemical reaction. It's been a while since we've had an example where the exponents in the equilibrium expression are anything other than 1.
But other exponents are actually fairly common for reactions like this one, where a compound dissolves to form ions. So don't forget to include exponents in the equilibrium expression when you need them. Anyway, now we can look up the value of Ksp in the appendix. The Ksp is 6.5 times 10 to the minus 9. Now we'll simplify the left side of the equation. When we square the value in the second bracket, we get 4x squared. Don't forget to square the entire term in the bracket, including the 2. If you don't, you'll get a much different answer at the end. Finally, we get 4x cubed equals 6.5 times 10 to the negative 9. We'll divide both sides by 4, and then take the cube root, which gives us 1.18 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. If you're not familiar with how to take a cube root, it's actually fairly simple. Just type the number that you want the cube root of, then raise it to an exponent of 1 third. Be sure to put the 1 third in parentheses. So we get a lead 2 iodide concentration of 1.18 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. Now we'll convert that into the mass. We have 1 liter of solution, so there are 1.18 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. The periodic table tells us that lead iodide weighs 461.01 grams per mole, so that means 0.544 grams of lead iodide dissolves in the water. Let's try one last thing. In several earlier videos, we talked about Le Chatelier's principle, which tells us that when we have a reaction at equilibrium and we disturb it by adding or removing a compound from it, the reaction will shift so that the equilibrium is eventually restored. That's true for all chemical reactions, and it's especially useful for reactions involving solubility. For example, suppose we had the reaction we saw earlier in which silver chloride dissolves. In that example, we imagined that the compound was dissolving in plain water, but suppose it was salt water instead. In that case, we'd have salt, sodium chloride, in our solution. The extra chloride ion from the salt would shift this reaction to the left, so that even less silver chloride would dissolve. This is an important concept if we're interested in environmental science or biology. Compounds that contain chloride will be less soluble in salt water than in pure water. That means that toxic compounds that contain chloride are more likely to precipitate in the salt water of the oceans than in freshwater sources like lakes and rivers. And that can have consequences for animals that feed at the bottom of the bodies of salt water. Let's try an example. Suppose we add lead 2 chloride to a liter of solution. But this time, instead of pure water, we'll add it to a solution of 0.100 molar potassium iodide. How much of the lead iodide will dissolve? We'll start with a rice table as usual. Here's the balanced reaction. Once again, we can leave out the data for the solid reactant. The initial concentration of lead ion is zero just like before, but this time we're starting out with an iodide concentration of 0.100. For the change in concentration, remember that the products are in a 1 to 2 ratio, so we have x and 2x. That means the equilibrium concentrations will be these. Now we'll plug these into our equilibrium expression. To simplify it, this time we have a little bit more work to do. We need to square the term in the second bracket, so we'll need to use the FOIL method. When we do, we find that multiplying the first terms gives 0 0.0100. Multiplying the two outer numbers gives 0.200x, which is also what we get when we multiply the two inner numbers. Finally, multiplying the last number in each parentheses gives us 4x squared. Now we'll multiply that by what's in the first bracket, which is x. That gives us this on the left side of the equation. To make it a bit easier to look at, I'll change the order so that the term with the highest exponent on x comes first. Finally, let's move everything to the left side of the equation. Usually, at this point, we'd solve this using the quadratic formula, but this time we actually don't have a quadratic equation. Quadratic equations always start with an x-squared term, but our equation starts with an x-cubed 
This kind of equation is a lot harder to solve than a quadratic formula, but fortunately we can simplify this a bit. The trick is to remember that the lead iodide only dissolves by a tiny amount, so x is going to be a very small number. Any very small number raised to an exponent is going to be even smaller, and it'll get smaller and smaller the larger the exponent is. That means that x cubed is going to be a very tiny number compared to the rest of the terms in the equation. In fact, it's so small that we can drop out the x cubed term. That's a trick you can use whenever you're solving a problem involving an insoluble compound. If you end up with an equation that has several terms, some of which have x raised to the third power or more, you can safely drop the term with the highest power of x. So let's do that with our equation. When we drop out the x cubed term, we end up with a quadratic equation, which we can solve in the usual way. When we do, we get x equals either 6.50 times 10 to the minus 7, or negative 0 0.0250. The negative number is an impossible value for a concentration, so we'll use the other value of x. That means we have a concentration of 6.50 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. Since we have one liter of solution, that's also how many moles of lead 2 iodide we have. Finally, let's convert that into grams. It turns out that 3.00 times 10 to the negative 4 grams of lead iodide dissolve in our solution. Notice that this is much less than the amount that dissolved in our earlier example when we were dissolving the lead iodide in pure water. In that example, 0.544 grams dissolved. That makes sense, because this time we dissolved the solid in a solution that already contained a salt with iodide ions in it. So Le Chatelier's principle predicted that the reaction would shift to the left and less of the lead iodide would dissolve. Well, that's enough new material for now. We've been examining reversible reactions for about a dozen videos now, so hopefully you now have a pretty good understanding of how they work and what we can do with them. When we meet again, we'll start looking at an entirely new topic. I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week.